All right, well, welcome everyone to our uh, all estates culture eminent scholar eminent uh, uh, seminar series, and I'm happy today to introduce our speaker, Deja Gouda. He's the Jacobson Distinguished Professor of Innovation and Entrepreneurship and a pro an Associate Professor of Biomedical Engineering at University of Texas San Antonio. He also serves as Associate Dean at the Graduate School to promote graduate student success. He received his undergraduate degree from India in Indian Institute of Technology, Bombay, and his PhD in Biomedical Engineering from the University of Texas, San Antonio, and completed a postdoctoral training at Wake Forest University. And as you can see, he's going to uh, teach us all about mechanics and biometric something of uh, to regenerate vascular tissue. Okay, uh, so thank you all for having me and thank you for that kind introduction. Um, I'll talk today a little bit about leveraging matrix mechanics and biomimetic materials. So our lab uh, does traditional tissue engineering and regenerative medicine. I started out in mechanical engineering and kept taking detours until I learned more biology than I ever thought I would know. Uh, and I did not realize I'd be speaking the weekend of Halloween, so we'll start with some interesting stories. But we use the same principles across different tissues, um, fairly materials agnostic as a lab. So it's not a biomaterial system I'm trying to put in, but more mimicking the native tissue matrix in each particular case, and then seeing how the mechanical cues interplay with the biochemical signals that are evaluated a whole lot more uh, frequently in the literature. So, when we look at native tissues, there is an incredible amount of complexity in the tissue itself. And if you're looking at the knee joint, for example, in this case, you notice that there are a bunch of tissues in fairly close proximity, which when you replace it, um, if it's injured or if you're putting in a knee implant, you're not capturing almost any of that complexity. Uh, more and more, in the state of the art right now in terms of replacing, let's say, a damaged tissue system is actually prosthetics because they're much more functionally reliable than tissue engineered solutions. So for all the research and fancy talk, the options that we have are fairly limited from a tissue engineering perspective. One of the challenges to this from, again, engineering speak is if you look at the tissues themselves, bone is extremely stiff in the two to 11 gigapascal range. You move to tendons and ligaments, you drop three orders of, two orders of magnitude, uh, and they're in the high megapascal range. You drop articular cartilage, you've now dropped a further two orders of magnitude. You're in the low megapascal range. And skeletal muscles, the softest one of those at 12 kilopascals. Notice I am talking literally about a 1.5 millimeter spatial change for seven orders of magnitude in mechanical stiffness. So this creates a pretty big engineering problem. The reason uh, we got involved in this sort of research is when I was doing my, and I am sorry, just as people are digging into their pastries and breakfast uh, to show that picture. But um, when I got involved in my PhD research uh, is when the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan were at their peak. And there were a lot of people, this particular person, uh, actually a patient who was brought into San Antonio in their 20s with a high caliber gunshot wound through the leg. Um, and as you can see, the tissue is highly damaged. And the reason why I have the micro CT scans of the bone from that person's leg is because there was an amputation. What preceded the amputation was an attempt to reconstruct the bone, which was 18 procedures over 22 months, right? And even after that, you notice with the titanium cage and trying to engraft whatever material they could find, you only have the thin, well, the pseudo color pink bone tissue form inside instead of what in our leg would be a solid cylindrical structure. So it's not load bearing. You're now talking about a person in their 20s who essentially suffered for almost two years through multiple procedures and still ended up with an amputation. So the choice that most people coming back from these sort of injuries choose is they just choose to get the prosthetic up front because then you're out on the road running maybe six weeks later with physiotherapy and that's it. Right. Whereas here, we're not really giving them an equitable option that seems like a fair deal, even if you're living with that for decades to come. And so the lab got interested in trying to make that a better choice. If you 
kind of can promise a better solution. Can I make it a tougher choice? And that's kind of what we're getting at. So I'll talk a little bit about bone first. Um, and the philosophy for bone tissue engineering and most tissue engineering at this standpoint is you have a material that allows the tissue to grow into it. You have the correct biochemical growth factors, in this case, bone morphogenetic protein. Um, bone morphogenetic protein 2, or BMP2, is extremely expensive. To grow every inch of bone costs about $6,000 in drug alone. So I'm not talking about surgical costs, I'm talking about cost of drug. It's highly potent. Um, you usually, in your body, make BMP2 in the picogram quantities. For growing each inch of bone, you usually use 1.2 milligrams. So when you give somebody a billion times what they would make in a lifetime, you would expect side effects, right? Uh, so you cannot use it anywhere except open fractures. If you put it in the head and neck to reconstruct bone, it swells up and chokes you. If you put it in the spine, you have excruciating pain because it swells up, right? And the, the third part of the triad is cells that will respond to these signals and then form bone, right? Now, in addition to this, you have the mechanical environment, and I'll talk a little bit about that as well. So our solution to this in a lot of ways is to mimic the native matrix, and we do this by creating porous sponges but making them out of ceramic. So these sponges are essentially the same foams that are used to insulate building walls, um, acoustic foams, and we coat them with a ceramic slurry, sinter it in the furnace, exactly how you would make ceramic pottery. The foam, the polymer, gets burnt out, it becomes water and carbon dioxide, and the structure is maintained by the ceramic. So these are pure ceramic foams. They're 85% porous, which means only 15% is actual solid, the rest of it is open space. Uh, they're strong enough to survive. They're not restoring it immediately, but as the tissue grows in, there's plenty of space to kind of build up and bulk up, and that's what becomes the bone. If you look at micro CT sections, that's human bone on the extreme left, and then we can make different pore sizes that kind of match what you're looking at. And what you would expect with this is as the pore size decreases, your strength increases, your permeability decreases, right? So the engineering trade-off here is how do I keep really good permeability in terms of keeping the cells alive while maintaining just enough strength to restore stuff. And over time, uh, cells on these tissues kind of grow into these pores and fill it up and restore the native bone tissue. So the scaffolds here in black and the cells are the ones that are depositing this matrix. Now, human bone is a composite of uh, collagen with hydroxyapatite. Here we have hydroxyapatite and the cells deposit the collagen in them. And as it bulks up, it closes up these channels. Okay. So the next thing we were interested in, like I said, was modulating the chemical environment. One of the big problems um, that we saw in the person with a gunshot wound is, of course, that because they came back from a battlefield, it was highly contaminated, which led to infections. So we were interested in delivering drugs off the surface of the scaffold. In this particular case, um, we're delivering BMP2 off the surface of the uh, scaffold, and that allows us to reduce the amount of BMP2 required by almost uh, to almost 20%. So instead of costing 6,000, it costs $1,200, uh, much more affordable, and has the same kind of efficacy. And similarly, we can also deliver antibiotics off the surface of the scaffold. So after exploring that, the next question was to look at the cell source, right? So stem cells are magical, they cure everything. So we kind of tested out this concept of seeding the cells at 20% coverage of the scaffold and 100% coverage of the scaffold to see if it improved. Now, like all good science, it turns out we were completely wrong in what we were doing. Having the cells on the scaffold actually prevented the recruitment of native cells within the body, right? And because the blood vessels didn't grow in fast enough into the scaffold, the cells that we put in died. So not only did they prevent their friends from coming in to help and continuing to rebuild, they also didn't sustain that regrowth. So the group without the scaffolds actually does, without the cells, sorry, actually does much better at eight weeks than the groups with the cells, which was interesting and humbling at the same time. So having learned how each of the factors 
affects regrowth overall. Um, we ended up looking at this in vivo. Well, all of these studies so far were in vivo. But we wanted to see if we could combine factors to make it better, right? Um, so the groups we have is currently, if you went to the clinic to regrow bone, you would use something called Infuse. It's a product by Medtronic. It earns Medtronic about two to three billion dollars a year, that one single product, which is based off the BMP2 I was just talking about. So our clinical control was that group of Medtronic. Uh, Medtronic supplies the BMP2 with uh, a collagen wrap, and the collagen wrap literally looks like a kin wipe, so it's like tissue soaked in BMP2, you stick it in the body and it becomes bone. BMP2 is fairly potent, so if you had a cut in your skin and you touched the powder, you would regrow a bone spur on the surface of your hand, because like I said, you're providing over a billion times what your body produces, right? So any stem cells that can find it will convert to bone. Our scaffold with a wrap around it to protect the local microenvironment. If I'm putting in a super expensive drug, I don't want it leaking out into the rest of the body. I kind of want it in that space. A one fifth the dose of what is clinically recommended, so we can potentially be more effective. Now, we coated the surface of the scaffold itself with collagen. Remember, we're trying to reproduce a composite, have the low dose of BMP2. And then finally, through everything but the kitchen sink added. So we added the MSC stem cells on there. We're like, now we have the drug, there's chemicals, there's everything, right? Okay. So what happens? Um, this is the infused group, the Medtronic one. You can, your bone is supposed to bend outwards because that's the shape of the bone. It doesn't really do a great job maintaining space. Um, there's no structure to it. So the soft tissue around the bone is actually scrimping on it, but the regeneration is bridged. So at least it restores something. In the rabbit, um, the convenience is you don't need metal fixtures because unlike human beings where our two bones in the hand are two separate bones, in the rabbit they're fused at the top and bottom. So one bone supports the other one mechanically. You have bone growing in, in three directions. The super bright white spots are the scaffold, by the way, and the light gray is native bone growing into it. Um, and it does a great job maintaining space. Turns out the low dose of BMP2 actually allowed bone to grow inside really well. So BMP2 does two things. One, it recruits cells. Two, it converts them to bone. So if I dump a gallon load of BMP2 into, into a space, it doesn't give the cells enough time to go all the way in. It starts converting them to bone, right? Now, the bone cells on the outside of the scaffold turn to bone and don't let any other cells go in because they've clogged up all the pores, right? It's like sending the 16-wheelers into the city first and having all the cars fall them. The cars are not getting a dose of anything. So it turns out the low dose of BMP2 works better than we expected than the high dose. So not only does it make it cheaper, it's actually more effective just because of how it works biochemically. And this is just a quantification of the slide before, which shows that the collagen-coated low dose BMP2 group actually does great even compared to clinical controls on the market right now in maintaining space. So not only is the amount of bone that regrows, it's also showing that over time it continues to recruit cells. Um, so this is the quantification of the story I was just saying. We have three different color tags at two weeks, four weeks, and eight weeks. And the low doses of BMP2 show that there's continued recruitment into the scaffold. Whereas in the high groups, it stops after the first two weeks because everything that came in turned to bone and it blocked off stuff, right? So that's how we quantify that. Um, this is exactly so. You can see that at the low doses, the two to four week period, there's continued regeneration. Whereas at the high doses, it's mostly in the early time and then it slows down drastically. So the activity of the cells uh, reduces in terms of forming bone because they're not being recruited. Now, adding the MSCs gave us no benefit for the second study in a row. I should have learned from the first one, right? Um, so the idea is we noticed why is when we added the cells, um, all the cells that we load onto the scaffold actually form necrotic tissue. That's the bloody black stuff you see on the surface, which you don't actually see in the doses uh, groups without cells. Is because the cells that we put in by eight weeks in at this point kind of are dying out because they're, the blood supply is not growing in fast enough. So the challenge now moves from 
having bone grow into the tissue to having the blood vessels grow in with the bone. So looking at the pore sizes of these scaffolds, we tried to figure out if the different pore sizes support the ingrowth of blood vessels better. That's one question. And more importantly, how we can make that process more effective. So if you look at the ginormous amount of literature out there in terms of what this optimal pore size is, there's a consensus that it should be at least 150 microns. Uh, there is a lot of interest in it being at least 500 microns. But that kind of depends on, you know, every graduate student makes a scaffold, has a baby, and that baby has a certain pore size. And if that experiment works, they graduate, and then they publish a paper that says this pore size is fantastic. However, the number of products on the market don't really match any of that published literature, which basically means for a lot of bone research labs to survive, everybody has their favorite pore size, which doesn't really help with the translation. Um, I don't have a favorite pore size, by the way. I have no horse in this race, just saying. Um, so this was when, uh, after nine years fiddling around as a biomedical engineer, I went back to my mechanics. And the idea is, you remember the cells were depositing a matrix. And that matrix has a different stiffness. As more and more cells grow in, the matrix gets denser and stiffer. And blood vessels don't invade stiff matrices. So when the matrices are soft, what I've taken is I've taken the micro CT image of the scaffold, inverted it. So you're looking at the pore space inside the scaffold the 85% porosity I'm talking about. Now the collagen inside this pore space is aligned in a certain direction and pulls at blood vessels as they grow in. So we're modeling the growth of blood vessels in different pore sizes, purely computational model, right? Looks super pretty. The posters look amazing. Everybody wants to talk to you. It doesn't help a whole lot, unless you can back it up with some sort of experimental validation. So for experimental validation, our blood vessel model is not cells. It's actually tiny microvascular fragments from adipose tissue. So in other words, what they're proposing is using microvascular fragments, which is you go in for a liposuction, you get your fat removed. Uh, anybody who has a bone injury would love to get a free liposuction on the side. And essentially, you take out all the adipose cells and you take just the vasculature and you chop it up. So you have tiny pieces of blood vessels. And that's what we're growing inside our scaffolds. So now for the experimental validation of that computational model I was showing you. I still like the pretty computational one. This is actual real data. Uh, doesn't look as clean. But you notice that in different pore sizes, the shape of the vessels is very, very different. So this is after day seven, day 14, day 21 of culture. What's happening is if there's no scaffold in the way, they grow in a haphazard network across the whole gel. If there is a scaffold with a large pore, it's like sitting in a big bean bag. They kind of curl up and curl up because there's no reason to get off the feedback, right? If you're in the smaller pore sizes, again, very surprisingly, because the idea has always been if I have a large pore, I can drive high base through it and life is great. If you have the small pores, because they're in an uncomfortable airline seat, they kind of want to spread out into the seats next to them, which from our perspective is great because it forces the blood vessels to bridge across the scaffold. Okay. I'll come back to this later. Now we noticed that this was because of the mechanotransduction on the surface of the scaffold. Uh, we did a lot of bioinformatics. Uh, and we found out that what's really changing is because the hypoxic environment inside the scaffold drives the growth, and the surface of the scaffold creates a mechanical field that regulates the growth. So there's two factors working in concert. And this is now the computational model, which again, this, Especially as a computational biomechanics person, it is insane to think your computational model will match experimental data. And that's the reason I'm this excited about it. Uh, because if you had told me beforehand, when I wrote the grant, I'm like, yes, it will match, but I didn't believe that for a minute. So having it actually match was very surprising. So that's our story on bone, and I'll come back to this later. And I'll switch gears a little bit to muscle mass, right? I'm gonna to go to the other extreme end of that spectrum, the softest tissue that there was. So again, same war defects in this particular case. Okay, so when we go to the gym, we injure our muscle on a regular basis, but the muscle regrows. In, in fact, it's designed to bulk up, right? 
So all of those amazing glamour shots on Instagram are because your muscle bulks up after you injure it, but you injure it just enough. So if you injure more than 40% of the volume of your muscle, it is not going to restore itself, and it's called a volumetric muscle defect. Very common after burn injuries. In the same philosophy of using materials that are extremely similar to the native matrix of the tissue you're replacing, we looked at a bunch of natural polymers. Collagen and fibrin, well, collagen is the native uh, polymer in skeletal muscle. Fibrin is what you form when you form a blood clot, when you injure it. Agarose and alginate come from seaweed, and collagen chitosan comes from the shells of sea food. Um, and we started looking at the mechanical properties of what would actually work. Now, alginate was too soft under any circumstances to also have cells and have enough integrity to put in. So it basically forms goop. Uh, that's a scientific technical term, by the way. The problem with agarose was actually really interesting. Um, instead of degrading over time, in this particular case, we want the material to get out of the way after protecting the cells just enough. Agarose keeps swelling and not degrading, which was a problem. And when we tested this with uh, skeletal muscle satellite cells, uh, specifically, we noticed that two groups did great, the collagen and the fiber, which shouldn't surprise us. Like I said, they're kind of the native matrix proteins of muscle. Uh, this was also proved with primary cells isolated from muscle, not just the cell lines. Um, and you notice that they form distinct uh, myofibers where you see multiple nuclei and things like that. Now, we were looking at the appropriate muscle is highly vascularized. That's how you don't, uh, that's how you maintain the metabolism and allow it to exercise so much. And we paired it with microvascular cells, and both of them, when they grow together, grow great. Put this in a bioreactor. All um, people are supposed to work, according to our amazing models, for two hours a day walking at one hertz. Uh, which basically means for at least two hours, you're supposed to walk and not be on the couch watching Netflix. That's kind of what that means. But more importantly, when you condition the muscles with those loads, you see that over time, the matrix we put in actually stiffens and grows stronger because the cells are depositing their own matrix. So our material, instead of degrading, the construct gets stronger. Um, and compared to the static culture, uh, just in Petri dishes, the bioreactor actually increases in strength by 300% or three times, right? So over time, this would bulk up uh, in the tissue. The more interesting story here is that in, if you had just the single culture of muscle cells, they mature a lot faster, right? So they form muscle much, much faster. The mature markers are very high with the bioreactor right after seven days. The cold cultures mature slower. They have earlier markers of myogenesis because the blood vessels are forming in concert. They're forming at the same time. So the overall system is more stable, but it takes longer, right? This is the whole hair and turtle corollary from our uh, stories back when we were kids. And the networks of blood vessels, which is the green stain at the bottom, are distributed uh, just as the muscle fibers in the top are. Um, as cool as in vitro cultures are, what's the proof that these blood vessels I'm talking about work? So this is those microvascular fragments that we got from fat tissue put in a fibrin gel in this case, and put into the muscle of muscle belly uh, gastro of a rat. And what we do is we perfuse the rat with uh, dye, which is only now going to go through any blood vessels in my construct that have hooked up to the body of the rat, right? So things that have put in. And then we stain it after uh, sacking the animal with lectin, which stains all blood vessels in that construct. So within that construct now, if you look at it, there's a lot of blood vessels in there by 14 days. And surprisingly, quite a bit of it is perfused and has hooked up to the native vasculature which shows that this is actually a therapy that could work in the clinics because you don't need a microvascular surgeon suturing little pieces of vessel. They kind of take care of it themselves. And it's always great when the body does something for you instead of you having to do work for them. I mean, engineering has gotten to where it is today by being lazy and cheap. So anytime somebody else is working for you, fantastic. Okay. So what are we working on right now? We're blending the collagen and the fibrin um, because pure fibrin all the way over here is gone within two days. 
pure collagen is still sticking around almost 80% of it, even after 14 days. Now, the idea is if the muscles are forming myotubes, we want our material to protect them through implantation and then get out of the way, right? So optimizing that degradation rate kind of gets us somewhere. Okay, so how would this look in terms of translation? You would take the optimized hy uh, hydrogel that supports both muscle and blood vessel network formation, maybe take it through a bioreactor, and you could decellularize it so it's available as an off-the-shelf kind of product. But is it really functional? Um, and well, we have the blood vessels in there, we have the muscle in there, but our muscles work because we tell them to, and we do that with nerves. So what we did next is to look at innervation of these muscle groups. So we came up with a system which is piezoelectric, which means it converts mechanical to electric signals and vice versa, coded that with a conducting polymer, so it's electroactive and this forms a core shell and we can now load it with drugs to work as a synthetic neuromuscular junction right so why are we interested in this neuromuscular junctions take electrical signaling convert it through chemical transducers to mechanical contraction and we want a system that can replicate this so we can get our muscle to now respond to neural signals uh, in this particular case, we do that by loading the piezoelectric electroconductive polymer system with drugs, uh, IGF-1, and we note that it's only released above five volts. Um, so there's no release, very little release of the drug above five, uh, below five volts. And then the drug that we release, remember, it's now subjected to a mechanical and an electrical signal. We want to make sure it stays active after release. And the data on the right shows that it performs the same as free drug. So we can now load different types of growth factors on the same biotin core, or you can have multiple ligands of the same growth factor on the biotin core. And based on how these uh, pathways work, whether the uh, receptor reaction with the growth factor is internalized or not, you can actually control the activity of it. We've demonstrated it with nerve growth factor, which we're interested in because we're talking about innervation, and with fibroblast growth factor, which causes muscle to bulk up, right? So that works great. Now, the interesting part is it's stable. The drug stays there unless subjected to an electrical signal, so it works as a drug depot. And when it's released, you see this amount of stain go down. If you continuously give it electrical signal, it will continue to release drug. More importantly, because these are aligned fiber mats, both muscle and nerve cells love alignment and they line up exactly with the fiber direction. So you can also make it oriented and function together because mismatched muscle is not very functional whereas aligned muscle is strong. So now in the future, we could potentially look at adding electrical signals within the bioreactor to then get a whole developed construct. Um, and we looked into contrast agents for looking at vasculature and native muscle and stuff. Okay, ligaments. I'm gonna jump around quite a bit and I promise I'll tie it back together. Okay, so for ligaments now, we use a polymer that's been used for over 5,000 years because it's been found to suture the tissues together in Egyptian mummies. So we've used silk for a really long time. Another native polymer. In this particular case, we're interested in bridging the bone ligament bone structure and we're making it out of a single piece of silk which has a fibrous crimp structure in the middle just like ligaments and the porous structure on the two ends that looks like bone i won't go super deep into it but the architecture in the middle and at the ends is very very different in terms of how that looks um let me see if that works perfect and these are fairly uh by the way, those structures about that big, which is kind of the size of uh, a native ligament. You can see it sustains conditioning at 20% strain, which is about how much you move when you flex your knee. And then when it pulls apart, it doesn't break at the ends, it breaks in the middle, which is kind of what you want from a good ligament that would strengthen over time. There. So now it's a different kind of bioreactor. In this, in this particular case, these ligaments are intracapsular, so they're inside the synovial fluid, so you kind of don't want to have major growth factor pathways because those cause inflammation, which in the synovial capsule would then lead to osteoarthritis, so you can't really trade one problem for the other. Um, so we're using 
injections that are already clinically used right now, which is injections of vitamins. So in this particular case, uh, calcitriol for stimulating the bone side and vitamin um, C, which is ascorbic acid for stimulating the ligament side of the regrowth. And the bioreactor is then set up in the lab to kind of pull these plates together at the same amount of conditioning, which is 20% strain. Again, human beings are still walking two hours a day at one hertz. Remember. So um, we notice that these structures itself also get stronger over 14 days of culture. And more importantly, with the dynamic culture and the vitamins, they actually break in different locations. So it means that they're strengthening on both the bone side and the ligament side over different periods of time. So there's an optimum there about when you should stop. Um, but, and this is an area that we're still actively researching. In the bioreactor I just showed you, the problem was that the ligament was great because it was under tension. Bone does horribly under tension. And it actually proved that because we were subjecting the bone part to some tensile load the bone was a lot more weird, which if you look at it clinically, is like having past immobilization when you have a fracture or a tear compared to what is called passive motion, which means a physiotherapist comes and does that, not you trying to do that, right? So passive motion is kind of what our bioreactor ended up simulating. But what we should have in our bioreactor is something that compresses the bone and puts tensile loads on the ligament. So that's the next iteration that needs to come about. And all of this was proven with a lot of PCR data. So let me, let me sum up. Um, I'll actually do it not too bad on time. That's good. OK, so let's sum up how we got here and why I was talking about all of these things that seem to make absolutely no sense, right? So we started out with a case of the injured soldier, which is kind of what got us into all of this and kept me in San Antonio after complaining about the city forever. Um, is because there was a overarching unsolved problem and once you get your teeth into it, it's hard to give up. So the bone started with my PhD work. Started in 2004. Ooh, just the top is missing. Hold on, let me see if I can do this. There. All right. So it started out developing the material in 2004. That was the porous hydroxyapatite scaffold. Doing the in vitro studies and Figuring out the drug delivery and the mechanical properties took four years, allowed me to graduate. And that was in 2008, where we started the small and medium animal trials, so rats and rabbits. That went from 2009 to 2013, was my postdoc. We went to large animal trials, which was pigs, uh, primates, dogs, and sheep in different models. So it was in the long bones, in the spine, in the mandible, in the calvaria. Uh, and that went from 2009 to 2017. Actually, went to clinical trials first in Europe and then in the US. It's approved in Europe. It's going through approval in the US. Uh, FE approved. So this is in patients now, the hydroxyapatite scaffold, right? No drugs, no growth factors, just scaffold system. The Muscle Project was my first PhD student. So she started working out in 2009. Uh, we took it to the small in vivo animal trials in 2014, started working on the vessels, blood vessels into the muscle in 2014, got to uh, in vivo again in the same study, started the nerves in 2018 with a new PhD student, has not gone in vivo yet. The ligaments was the next PhD student in the lab group, started in 2014, figured out the silk, got it through in vitro trials, uh, just ready for in vivo, now waiting on grant support if NIH is listening. And that was in 2019. The tendons part started in 2018. It's a completely different beast because it goes from bone through tendon to muscle. And the alignment is completely different from ligaments. So ligaments, in my opinion, was the easier problem to solve. We haven't touched cartilage at all. Cartilage is avascular. Uh, people have thought it would be the easier tissue to solve for about 45 years and have been proven wrong. And I was proven wrong in plenty of other places, so I didn't feel like that was most important challenge on my plate. And then the pandemic hit, right? So you see everything stopped in 2019, uh, well, 2020-ish. But when the pandemic hit, we were working with the Air Force, and we had been working with them for about three years before that, because they were moving 
their injured war fighters from Iraq and Afghanistan and stabilizing them in Germany or uh, Baltimore and then flying them to San Antonio, which is about a 24 hours of flying time. And these are people on ventilator support, right? So we were looking at how you can maintain them to get them to recover from ventilator support better. When you get hit with a respiratory pandemic and a lot of people get on ventilator support, guess which project becomes really important all of a sudden, right? So um, we started working on the vocal folds and trachea in terms of looking at inflammation in the upper airway about 2018, different PhD student. And in 2019, that got fast track to small animal studies. Small animal studies can't really be done in rats and mice for upper airway because the size, it's just not worth engineering the system that goes that small because it has no practical applications. So the smallest we do is rabbits. Uh, those models are fairly tricky because rabbits like licking their fur and dying on you most of the time by choking on their own hair. So it's, it's, not, it's not great. And then we move really rapidly this year um, through again Air Force support to pigs to figure out if we now essentially have an endotracheal tube, which is the piece that's placed inside your upper airway uh, to do drug release. The idea is the biggest problem right now, people who are put on ventilators, is that when you're breathing through the mechanical tube, the tissue around gets inflamed and the inflammation damages the tissue. So even when you fight off the disease and you take off the tube, your tissues now don't have the mechanical strength to keep you breathing. So you're losing volume over time in terms of how much breath you can take in and how much respiration, which means recovery is bad. And that's the reason people who go on ventilators are considered to be higher risk in terms of fatality. So what we're doing is while the ventilator is keeping the airway open, you release the drugs to prevent the tissue around it from degrading. So that's the whole concept behind this, right? So let's talk a little bit about upper airway restoration. So essentially, the reason we got into it is because of people who had lacerations in the throat. Uh, turns out when you're in battle combat or at close quarters, most slicing wounds happen in the neck. So the idea was these people need then ventilators to keep them on machine support till they're brought to a pristine clinic because you wouldn't treat something like this in the battle. So that's kind of what's going on. Um, now, what this causes is this causes inflammation, which causes stenosis, which is simply it closes the airway, right? And it's happening because the injury to your inner epithelium sets off an inflammatory cascade, which causes the muscle tissue, the soft tissue, to become fibrotic, so it stiffens and scars. And then it brings in a lot of inflammatory factors, which cause it to swell up because there's a lot of water retention in that tissue. So there's two problems. So the first thing was how do you heal the wound on the inside? And we needed something sticky. The inside of your throat is covered with mucus. Uh, that's kind of what comes out when you cough. And the idea was to come up with something that was mucoadhesive. So we looked at what nature does uh, to be sticky. This is not a novel concept. These are the underpads of the feet of geckos. Um, geckos stick to surfaces really well. And they do that by having tiny pillars on the pillar pads on the bottom of their feet, which both bend and are adhesive, and that stores enough energy to kind of keep it from not falling off. Not very different from the sticky notes that 3M makes. It's a very similar concept. Or now you have the command scripts that allow you to hang stuff on walls, right? Same concept. It's micro texture. So essentially, it's an array of posts, right? This is not our data. This is other people have tried this in the past. It's kind of used in industrial adhesives all over the place. Now, we had to now create the system with materials that the body will tolerate, so something more biocompatible. So in order to do that, we started out with polypaprolactone to form the fiber base, because the tissue itself needs to have good, stiff mechanical properties. We used something that's been used in textiles before called flocking. So you apply an electrical field, and that forces these flocks to be deposited on the surface of your electrospun mat. The flocks are made of PEG, uh, polyethylene glycol. And after you treat it with ultraviolet light, it kind of attaches to the fiber mat. So now I have a fiber mat, which is like a textile, and it has these tiny tufted flocks. So it's almost like a soft memory. Those memory foam mats you stand on in the kitchen, that's what it feels like. And it's super sticky, so it adheres to the mucous membrane. That's kind of what's going on. So what does that look like? You have the material only 
the material coated with peg. And then you have different densities of flocks on the surface, and you can kind of see the flock in profile, right? So these are not super high flocks, but because they, they're forming one side of a Velcro strip, and your mucosal membrane is providing the other side of a Velcro strip. So when I stick them together, it sticks. The reason for doing that is suturing a flock, a, a patch on the inside of your throat is not the most convenient operation. It's simply an access issue, right? So you need the tools to be able to suture properly. They do it all the time. Kudos to the surgeons, but it's not the easiest. And if it doesn't have enough structural stability, it's gonna fall into your airway and then you'll, you're gonna choke on it. So the risk is super high and you needed something that was adhesive. Okay. So the properties are slightly stiffer than the native trachea, but not by a whole lot. It's fairly manageable in terms of what you would do. Uh, it does swell at different concentrations. So the more flocks we have, the more it swells up, which is not the greatest. And it degrades in a very controlled manner. Um, so the swelling equilibrium goes up with flocks and the final weight goes up with flocks. The muco adhesion was really interesting to see. So what we did is we took porcine uh, mucosa and actually the mucosa stays alive for about seven days if you leave it in culture even after the animal's dead. Um, and we kind of adhere our flax on the top surface. So you basically do a shear peel test. And then you figure out how well your patch adheres to the mucosa underneath it. So the pure mats don't do great. And at this concentration of flocks at a fixed number, we actually get a really high muco adhesion. So the inner lining of your uh, upper airway has a native undulation of its own, right? So it has a characteristic profile. So obviously when our flocks were spaced at equivalent ratios, you ended up getting really good stickiness between the two of them. So this is pure mechanical stickiness. There's nothing chemical going on about this. Now, the advantage of doing this is both the polymers we're using in our system can be loaded with drugs. So both the fiber mat as well as the flocks with different drugs. The flocks swell up like crazy. The PCL does not. So anything you put in the PCL is released slowly over time. Anything you put in in the flocks is released pretty much in a burst manner, like bolus as soon as you put it in, as soon as the water gets in there which allows you to then um, tune what sort of drugs or multiple drugs you put in to prevent infection, to keep inflammation down long term, stuff like that. Um, the interesting part is these different flock patches are also great at supporting sutures. So if the surgeon doesn't feel comfortable that they have good adhesion, you could put in sutures and they won't tear. So you can actually double down and make sure it's not getting away. Uh, this is testing in a cadaver, so you actually show that it sticks to human mucosa in this particular case, and you can place it even over the vocal folds and it stays there. So all of this is published um, data. Okay. So the suture retention strength is directly related. So we had an idea of an electrospun concept, and now we get to the point of the patent upper airway. So in the upper airway, you use the same PCL, electrospin it on the surface of the endotracheal tube. So this is the endotracheal tube that's put in your throat. And you coat it with PEG, which is that soft layer of soft tube. Um, the biggest problem for us was inflammation, remember? And if you have something abrading against the inside of your throat, uh, you have high inflammation. So the surface of a native endotracheal tube, as prepared, is plastic. It's hard plastic. And it's fairly smooth. So adding the fibers actually makes inflammation go up, but adding the gel coating now makes it smooth and you don't have the inflammation again. So it's really interesting to see that. So how we make it as a composite design, that's what the coated sample looks like. Uh, that's the pristine endotracheal tube surface. So with no coating at all. And once the coating is deposited, the relative thickness is still pretty small. So the overall coating is not very thick. So you have, we can modulate different sizes of electrospun fibers, you can actually see fibers that you can load with drugs that are much more porous if you want a faster release. Um, and the reason we were looking at different diameters was simply to see if we could modify the drug release profile. So that's what we were interested in this case. Once we coated with the polymer on top of it, um, you essentially end up with a more gel-like coating. So this is just the fiber coating, this is the gel coating on top of that. And as you can see, it's much smoother. 
not only that, we got the stiffness to match the native mucosal tissue of the body, so it feels very like itself. Um, the one way to reduce friction the most is make the two surfaces be as similar to one another as possible. And even with the additional gel, you basically don't have high thickness, and we can modify the density of the peg, again, to control drug release from it. So we proved that with the increase in molecular weight of the peg, the swelling is controlled by that, and it keeps the degradation rate down, which is important because anything that comes off the coating is aspirated into the lungs, and I really don't want to leave stuff behind. That's not good. Um, so you're, we were really interested in understanding the mechanical properties of these surfaces, and this is all at the nanoscale rather than at the AFM or the nano, uh, sorry, this is all at the micro scale, not at the nano scale. So we're looking at micro indentation to figure out exactly what the different materials were. And by micro indenting in the 20 micron-ish range, you can detect layers of membrane, if there's any cells growing on it or biofilm forming, any extracellular matrix that's secreted by them. And especially if there's epithelialization, which is um, the inner lining of the mucosa, if we have any of that stuck on it, the mechanical properties of all four are drastically different, right? So by basically doing a bunch of spots on the surface and then looking at where those spots lie, we know what covers the surface. That's kind of what we're getting at. And we use this both on the tissue engineering side as well as on endotracheal tube side of it. Um, so the PCL fibers by themselves, very, very stiff. Pay attention to the y-axis, the size of the numbers in the y-axis. And the PEG coating, very, very soft, right? So it's gone down about two orders of magnitude in terms of how stiff that is. And then we have the fibers that are coated, the combination is somewhere in between. So basically we made it slightly less stiff and much smoother, so hopefully it won't uh, inflame the inner lining. Now the first question anybody would ask is, why don't you just use the peg, because it's much softer? It's because the peg is like jello, so it'll just slide off the tube. So having the fiber coating allows us to retain the peg on the tube, whereas the peg properties is kind of what we're going for. Um, so the epithelial cells don't stick to the peg, which is great because I don't want the cells growing in because then removing the tube is going to be a nightmare. And we tested this by looking at what happened to the mucosa when you slid the uh, endotracheal tube along the surface of the trachea. So we took tracheal samples, took our tube, the coated tubes and the uncoated tubes, slid them across in a bioreactor to see what the impact on the trachea was. There we go. So at different, this is bare ET tube. You can see that without the coating, although it's really smooth, it's really hard and stiff, and that causes a lot more abrasion in your mucosal lining. Whereas at different uh, densities of PEG, especially when the PEG coating is adhering, you see the maintenance of the top mucosa in mucosal lining in on the surface of the trachea. So that was really interesting to us. That, Modifying these mechanical properties allows us to not damage the tissue we're trying to keep safe. So right now, this is in um, animal trials. These are pigs. Um, there's a drastic difference between how inflamed they get when they're injured. And we're releasing factors from it, biological factors, that keep the inflammation down, corticosteroids mostly, as well as RNA therapy to kind of prevent fibrosis from happening. Uh, that's what the ET tube looks like when it's taken out of the pig. And the inner lining of the larynx still looks fairly pristine, which is kind of what we were going for. If it was inflamed, it should look something like that right there. Okay, so in terms of what the lab's been developing, we're looking at biomaterials design, 3D printing, to figure out how we make our materials. We're looking at bioreactors to provide the same mechanical environment that the tissue would see inside the body, outside the body, so we can model it better. Also, remember the cheap part, um, animal studies are ridiculously expensive. Just to give you all an idea, the animal cost alone, not research cost, of that endotracheal tube project is $1.1 million, right? So doing large animals is prohibitively expensive. The rat studies or the rabbit studies would usually run for a cohort of animals somewhere around a quarter million. So moving into the bioreactor space takes one zero off the price. So if I have a ton of variables, 
one, it's unethical to have that many animals and I'm not even going to get into that, but it allows me to choose the best groups to go forward while still maintaining the integrity of the science. So in a lot of ways, it's necessity as well as limited resources that make us do that. So we develop bioreactors to understand that environment and mimic it in vitro so we know what is likely to fail out. So most of these technologies don't tell us what's going to succeed, but they definitely tell us what won't work, right? So it allows me to screen it down on that end. And then we make biomechanical models to understand how these systems work, both computational fluid dynamics as well as uh, solid uh, finite element models to figure out stress. And of course, you've seen some of the drug delivery platforms that we've been looking into. Um, one of the projects I didn't talk about today, just so we leave at least 10 minutes for questions, sorry if I went fast, is our 3D printed tooth. Um, so in this case, it's printed out of a pure ceramic. We actually are testing out right now, we can kind of make a hole in the jaw of an animal, put the tooth in, and it will erupt like a natural tooth once it's completely colonized. Uh, that is the same size as a human third molar, by the way. It's made to scale. Um, and using a bioreactor in that platform, you can basically set up a flow. The microvascular fragments from fat I was talking about allow the creation of an inner lining of pulp inside the tooth, just like your tooth would have. And the outside is again made from hydroxy appetite, which fills up with ceramics. Uh, sorry, with the uh, tension. And at this point, I'm done. Um, as much data was presented, I probably only touched the bone side of it. And after that, I've been responsible for making sure the lab is funded. And all the great work has been done by the PhD students who've been working with us over time. We have a lot of undergrads in the lab as well, um, working on all of these projects. And I'd really like to highlight um, Sole Miar, uh, a postdoc who's also a grad student who's working on the upper airway stuff, um, and Joe Pearson who's working on the ligament stuff and Beth on the muscle stuff. Um, so with that, I'd like to thank my funding sources as well as the lab group and more than happy to take any questions at this point. Thank you. Questions from the audience in the room? So actually, I have a question. Yes. So first of all, it was very, very interesting. I thank you for that. Thank you. So my question is about the, the part that you talked about the bone regeneration. So the cell type that you used was the stem cells. Have you ever tried the idea instead of the stem cell using the fully differentiated cells like the osteoblast, which is responsible in making the bone themselves? Uh, so these, these stem cells are uh, human uh, MSCs, and once you condition them in osteogenic media, they turn to bone into an osteoplastic lineage pretty quickly. Um, the reason we don't use fully differentiated cells, we tried that by the way, um, we don't use fully differentiated cells is because when they're fully differentiated, they're at a, in a phase where they're not producing as much ECM. We started out with a pure ceramic, so we want them to be in a highly proliferative stage, so they deposit a lot of protein, and fully differentiated cells don't do that. They mineralize protein. So if you're starting with soft materials, there's a lot of groups that work on polymers for bone tissue engineering. It makes sense to have more differentiated cells because you need them to mineralize. Because I'm starting with a mineral, I don't want them fully differentiated. So that's the rationale for at least our models. Uh, when you were talking about the in vivo innovation of muscle that you haven't done that yet. Mm -hmm. But um, I mean, I, I was just I'm curious yeah. about how you plan on uh, targeting or getting the, the nerves to even know that they have to go and grow to muscle or fiber. Um, that would be really interesting. So there, there are, for example, if you release or deliver something called agrit, it causes neuromuscular junctions to form and skeletal muscle. If you release and secrete nerve growth factor, the neurite outgrowth is going to reach those neuromuscular junctions. So if, but you need to release them in the right space and at the right time. So because our material is stimulus responsive, in the sense I'm not doing anything or controlling anything, the cells applying the mechanical strain on the piezoelectric material cause the release of something. The cells can dictate when that thing is released and that I can dictate what I'm releasing so that I can have the desired effect. Right? So it's essentially, when, when muscle tubes are forming, they need the nerves to connect at some point. 
So as long as I can build in the right stimulus responsive cues into the material, you can kind of make that happen. Right now, what we're doing with the platform is actually not using it for regeneration at all, but actually we use it for preservation. So if you have a spinal cord injury, the native muscle and nerve connection degrades over time because the nerves are damaged upstream, right? So we can use the patch to keep it intact till the nerve is bridged on the spinal cord side so that people don't lose control because it's degraded while the spine surgeons are fixing the spine. So, so we're using it in different applications. And very honestly, given past experience, until it works, I have no idea if it will. So we'll right. see how that works. I, I think that was sort of my question. Yeah. It, the connections are, are lost because it, it degrades. It degrades. You, you have a window. So they've actually found out if you stimulate it in the first week, you mm -hmm. damage it on purpose. So you have to wait for the degradation cascade to just start, but not go too far when you start influencing it. So the magic window seems to be at least in rats between days 14 and 21. Now, will that hold it humans? Nobody knows. Yeah. So it's, it's really interesting to, to get into that space. Yeah. Uh, thank you for your talk. Uh, I have a question about the, the adhesive uh, material that you explained. So uh, what is the life uh, lifetime of the material? For how long they stick like, uh, to the location? So uh, the epithelialization, re-epithelialization, or the closure of the wound takes less than 21 days. So most of the testing we've done has it going past that. So we do go to 28 days, and we show that it's stable. Um, very honestly, at that point, if the wound has been closed and it's staying closed, then you're probably going to take out the patch instead of leaving it in there. So the idea is to not, and you're going to re-injure it, but at that point it's pro-healing, so it shouldn't inflame. That's not me. Other questions? I have a couple questions. One, um, when you're uh, trying to uh, correlate animal studies with human studies, uh -huh. um, how do you account for um, the time of, uh, of recovery and regeneration, you know, between the two, because the mass is different, uh, but also is the is the timing different, the growth rate different? Um, so yes, and uh, we we know a lot about this in bone. Uh, we know a little less about it. I know a little less about this in soft tissue, but those data exist in terms of correlation. It's mostly based on both metabolic activity as well as growth rate. Uh, so bone has something called a bone remodeling unit, which works on a certain time scale. So in rats, a two week cycle is in rabbits, a two and a half week cycle is in pigs and sheep, a one month cycle is in humans about a two month cycle. So that's about the relative ratio of time. Uh, the dosage is a completely different beast in and of itself. Uh, correlation to weight is what's used commonly. In most cases, it's pretty bad. Uh, in a lot of cases, the drug companies have an incentive to overdo it rather than underdo it in terms of how drugs are developed commercially. So that's another question as well. So there's no incentive to do drug trials at lower doses because they would rather sell a higher dose and justify price. It is what it is. Um, so it, it really becomes interesting if you could get the same efficacy at a lower dose, and how do you do that on a population? Um, now, in terms of the soft tissue, the rates are not just different. For example, with two uh, models, as well as with epithelial or muscle, rats and rabbits are very deceptive because they're rodents, they're supposed to survive and scavenge for food. They regrow just about everything. And when you move to the pig models, everything doesn't work and you're like what happened here so there um there's this rabbit study with dental regeneration and the teeth in the top in the maxilla were removed and the tooth from the bottom just continues to grow until it locks your jaw tight because teeth and rabbits don't stop growing now you and i don't have that problem or luxury depending on how you look at it so um and if you don't treat them properly they'll grow tusks because their teeth don't stop and um, that's not how our physiology works. So it, it slows down quite a bit as you go up the mammal size. And um, the pig stuff, um, as well as uh, sheep, usually replicates the human brain very closely. 
So it's, it's at that level, it's usually not a problem. The jump from small animals to big animals is a much bigger problem figuring out. And what is what what uh, size, what 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 age of pigs? These are these are uh, the, well. All the data today is the Yorkshires, and the Yorkshires are about that big and about five hundred pounds. So yeah, they're. And they're 300 to 500 they're adolescents or they're they're all skeletally mature we don't we don't do anything in adolescence because their growth rates so we're trying to mimic a fully skeletally mature human being so no no adolescence at all okay. my other question is regarding um, cell signaling pathways and if you're if you if you or others i'm sure others are looking at um, seeing if you can also replicate um uh, you know the the cell signaling and the in the uh, translation of proteins that are occurring um, to make sure that you have not only I mean a functional organ yep. is much more than the mechanics and, and anatomy. Absolutely, and you're, you're spot on. Actually, there's been a lot more work on that in in tissue engineering, right? So uh, the reason we're focusing on the mechanics is because there's so much more known about a chemical signal. Now, the long-held hypothesis was that the chemical signaling overrides the mechanical signaling, especially if you're using growth factors at much higher concentrations. So the hypothesis here is once you get closer to physiological, the mechanical and chemical signaling may not be orders of magnitude off. So we're now more interested in figuring out if by using the right mechanical cues, I can reduce the amount of chemical overrides required. So uh, we're... In each of our experiments, we have the chemical control groups that are well known from literature about what works and what doesn't um, to know if they work together in synergy or against one another. And that's kind of what we're more interested in. But you're absolutely right. And there's a lot more groups working on the chemical side of it, the biochemical signaling and, and signal right, So stimulating upregulation of um, exactly. uh, genes and yes. translation to proteins yes. that are absolutely so we have all of that data and the control groups uh, and then we see how the mechanical signal interacts with that transcript tone for lack of a better word we have a question online i have a question online how much voltage and power pbdf provides in the muscle tissue and controlling the movement so um right now we're not actually using it to provide power or uh, voltage we are using the electrical signal to be used to deliver a drug and the mechanical signal to deliver a different drug potentially or the same drug. Uh, and it needs to be at, at least five volts for that to be affected. And if you have a bunch of cells along the length of a fiber, the overall electrical and mechanical signal generated is enough to create that sort of delivery. Uh, we have not looked into thermal conductivity. The way the free electron transfer in polyparole works on the surface there might be thermal conductivity, though I'd be a little surprised if there was significant thermal conductivity. When we heat it up to five volts, it does not heat up significantly in, in vitro. So I'd be surprised if that was a factor, but it might be because the cells would experience it locally and I really don't know the answer to that. Thank you. So what, what kind of current are you talking about? Five volts direct current in this case. But, but uh, I mean, what about amps? Uh, it's, in it's less than one microamp, so it's, it's right, really so tiny. Yeah, I don't expect it to. Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, again, thank you all for coming and asking your attention.